Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast about the history, nature and folklore of this wonderful wee country. I'm Jenny, a lovely, tall, straight, strong Scots pine tree, just minding my own business in a lovely native forest full of birdsong and wild cats. And I'm Annie, an enthusiastic woodcutter with a very big axe. Ah, pickle my woodpeckers, not again. You don't need to worry, Jenny. You are being chopped down for an excellent reason. Because the Highland Games are just around the corner and you are the perfect shape, size and weight of tree to become a caber. Oh, nice. I've always wanted to do a cartwheel. Oh, Jenny, you'll be spinning all right. You'll be spinning all day and all night. Because over the next few months, as spring blooms into summer, Countless folk from all across the globe will be gathering for Highland Games. And is there any spectacle more associated with the Highland Games than the grand old caber toss? I'm going to be a star. (laughs) (laughs) And just like a star, you'll be in the sky. Because if there's one thing a caber does, it's fly. (laughs) But yes, soon many a fields will be filled with piping, dancing, and of course... Eating? Well, I was going to say competing, but yes, there is plenty of eating too. Over the last couple of hundred years, the Highland Games have become synonymous with Scottish culture and tradition. And in this episode, we're going to explore the amazing history of these traditional Highland gatherings. We're going to be looking at the Highland Games from their 11th century origins, through their role in clan society and their royal and romantic revival and development into the modern day games as we know and love them today. All right, so let's limber up and jump in. Ah, oh, I cannot limber, Annie, for I am timber. <laughs> <laughs> Before we venture in to the intriguing details of the Highland Games, let's have a look at the broader European context. There's a massive history of major sporting competitions. I mean, we've got tournaments or tourneys in the medieval, early modern period where we've got contests such as jousting or archery. I mean, we could go all the way back to the ancient Greeks and their Olympics if we wanted to. Well, we don't even need to travel that far across the sea because there's an ancient Irish sports and cultural celebration called the Talchen Games. There's really cool lore about these games. Have you heard of the mysterious Irish deity Talche? I I have. She's possibly a goddess, possibly a giant, but she's definitely an exceptionally strong leader. She clears Ireland of trees to make fields, and these fields are rich and ready for agriculture. Yes, Talcha, she tears out the trees and she moves all of the boulders to make beautiful flat fields that are perfect for either livestock or arable farming. Perfectly fertile, with nothing to get in the way of a plough. However, all of this very hard work to make the whole of Ireland beautiful for farming absolutely sucks up all of her strength. She uses all of her energy and she exhausts her spirit to the brink of ruin. Now she looks upon her work and she is filled with joy to see the land perfectly prepared for the farmers to take their plows to the field, but the exhaustion has broken her heart wide open. And so the fields stand ready for the people to sow and grow and harvest. But Talcha herself, she was shattered. This would be her last great feat. And though she had succeeded, it would come at the cost of her life. And so she lay on her deathbed and she requested that her stepson Lou would arrange some funeral games in her honour to be a celebration of her life and her sacrifice. And so... The Talchen Games are born. We know that they were held in the first millennium, about the 6th to 9th centuries, 
and they ended about a thousand years ago, though have had some revivals since. But because we're dealing with a slightly blurred picture of the history, with very limited records remaining, there's a lot of guesswork about when these games actually started. A few sources suggest that these games could have started almost 4,000 years ago, which is incredible, though in my estimation it seems a trifle over-ambitious. We know either way that these are ancient games, we just don't know how many thousand years back they go. I like how it's the dates of the games that are a bit of a stretch and not the goddess giant of destruction and agriculture that pushes your boundaries. (laughs) (laughs) I'm happy to accept the legend that an ancient woman cleared the fields for farming. (laughs) (laughs) But Ireland and Scotland share pretty special Celtic connections as modern parlance puts it. But can we actually really connect these funeral games to our Highland games? And just what in the turnipy earth, Annie, is a funeral game? It doesn't sound very fun. The Talchin games mixed sporting contests and cultural exhibition. They were not just about athletic strength and competition, but they also held deep spiritual undertones. These games were a commemoration of the dead. So it's about renewing the community's bonds with their ancestors, their legendary heroes, and their beliefs. Okay, okay, so it's funereal in that all these folks are gathering in honour of the dead, but instead of solemn mourning, there's much more activity. There's games, there's action. We have all the classics. Chariot racing, sword fighting, spear throwing, jumping, hurling, singing, dancing and storytelling. You know, I have heard that it's not an ancient Irish funeral until someone's done a long jump. (laughs) It might sound a wee bit strange, but I see funeral games as communities choosing to honour their dead by using their grief to fuel their skills and to share those skills. Just imagine it as a massive showcase of strength and skill and art from everyone in your community coming together, both for those who have come before, but those who are there now. It's a really powerful bond. It's also saying, you know, we can go forward into the future because... We have this strength, this skill, this culture, this art, and we are sharing. Yeah, I think it's an example of how people show respect for the dead by coming together and celebrating the life that is in all of us. Furthermore, the Talchin Games were a time of peace. We have bards coming together, learning laws and verse from one another. And though the cultural context is obviously very different for modern Scotland than for ancient Ireland where these games are happening, still it shares similar aspects and parallels to the modern Highland games. However, when we jump back into the Scottish Highlands, we can see that we really cherry-pick landscape-specific events, so we don't have the chariot racing but we have significantly more stone throwing and stone related games. Though again, these still connect back to very similar things that were happening in the Talton games. That does match our landscape, lots of stones to throw. But I do love the cultural side of the Highland games and I think that is something that the Olympics is, they're, they're missing a trick there. They did used to have arts competitions in the modern Olympics until the 1940s. But unfortunately for us, there's no Olympic category for podcasting. Well, maybe we could make one for podcasting funeral games. I mean, the ultimate podcasting funeral game is just looking at our finances, Jenny. (laughs) As in our finances are funereal? Highland games as we know them today connect us to some beautiful mythology, tradition and culture. I think it's really fun to be doing this topic after we talked about Fingal's Cave in the last episode we released because the main story around Fingal's Cave is two giants throwing rocks as far as they can at each other. And if we compare this to the Highland games where we see the shot putt where competitors are flinging heavy stones as far as they physically can just as though they're giants... It's easy to see how these ancient stories of strength are carried through in this modern day to modern stories of strength. 
Exactly! Stories of incredible strength are plentiful in Gaelic mythology, and we see so many of these in the sports and physical contests of the Highland Games. I always feel so positive when Highland Games seasons begin in the summer, because you see them popping up across the globe as a real way to connect people to both ancient and modern traditions of Scotland. And similar to much of the history that we look at, the beginnings of the Highland Games are shrouded in mystery and myth. But let us peer through the mists of time, back to when Scotland was a fledgling nation of just a few hundred years old. It was a time when competing factions bitterly and brutally fought over power and the throne. And in 1058 Common Era, Malcolm McGonaghy killed Macbeth's stepson Lulach to become King Malcolm III of Scotland. And King Malcolm achieved the fabulous nickname of Malcolm Canmore during his reign, meaning Malcolm Big Head. Which I'll be honest, Annie. <laughs> As someone with a bizarrely small head, if I was to be remembered a thousand years from now as Jenny Smallhead, I don't, I don't really know how I'd feel about that. Probably not great. Oh, Jenny, I think you've gone for quite a literal translation there that doesn't take any of the nuance of the language. While the Gaelic Kian Moore does directly translate to big head, it actually means that he was a great chief, that he was a good king. And we use head in the same way in English if you think head teacher or head of operations. However, I do think Jennifer Smallhead suits you as a forever nickname. Oh, great. Thanks. I, you know, I do think I would be a terrible leader, so maybe it is quite a good way to remember me. <laughs> but alas, legend has it that old Malcolm Bighead called all of his subjects to meet deep in the Cairngorms at the Braes of Mar. The aim of this gathering was not to garner loyalty, impose his will, or settle disputes, but rather to find the fastest man in all the land. This man would become Malcolm's personal running footman and stride far and wide across Scotland, ensuring that the king's royal messages were delivered in the fastest manner. Braes of Mar is known today as Bray Mar, and Malcolm's challenge was a simple one. The first man to reach the top of Craig Honig from the centre of Bray Mar would win, and not only become the king's most important messenger, but also be rewarded with a fine belt, a strong sword, and a purse full of gold. Wow, a mountain race. This sounds epic. Well, yes, sort of, but before you conjure up a towering image of this mountain in your head, I'll just leave the walkhighlands.co.uk description of Craig Conyich here, and if you'd like to read it. <laughs> Craig Conyich is the diminutive but beautiful little hill just east of Braemar. Its ascent makes a short but very steep walk. Oh no, poor baby, it's diminutive and little not gonna lie this feels like a big insult to call a hill little like no one wants to be the little hill no one yeah well it is just a modest 165 meters tall and the path to the top of it is only three quarters of a mile long so king malcolm's test seems to be one less of endurance and more of speed which, if I'm being honest, Annie, doesn't seem like the most robust way of finding the best long-distance messenger runner in all your land. <laughs> I wonder if the old adage of tortoise and hare was around in Malcolm's day. Well, if it was, it did not seem to cross his mind. And on the day of the challenge, folk from far and wide descended upon the braes of Mar. Some came to race, others came to watch... And I'm sure there were a fair few who came for a dram or two with old friends. The rowdy crowd hushed as the competitors gathered by the bridge, limbered up and ready to run. Amongst the lineup of fine athletes, the two eldest McGregor brothers from Baloch Bui were by far the favourites. Silence fell as the king himself approached the start line. He raised his sword high into the air and brought it swinging down to beat on his shield. And with this, 
the men were off. In the calamity, many fell behind and even fell over, but a large group pushed ahead. With the men still in clear view, the third and youngest of the McGregor brothers came bounding out of the crowd of roaring spectators and begged King Malcolm to be allowed to run in the race as a late entrant. King Malcolm, looking to the men out in front, pointed out that the lad was at a severe disadvantage by this point. But the young fellow was so enthusiastic that the king gave him permission to run and whoosh, he was off. The sprightly boy made easy work of the slower runners and with the speed of a fleeting stag quickly caught up with the small group of kilted men who were out in front and tearing up the side of the hill. By halfway, there were just a handful of men out in the lead, and by three quarters of the way, there were just two men fighting it out for first place, the two elder McGregor brothers. But they were tiring, and the youngest of the three brothers had soon all but caught them. The middle brother's burning legs were faltering, and he could sense his younger foe about to overtake him. In desperation, he threw out his arms in the hopes of catching his sibling up but instead of striking his brother's chest, he felt nothing. There were but ten yards left in the race, and the middle brother stole a look around, expecting to see his younger brother far behind. But instead, he felt a kilt brush below his knee, and saw to his horror that his younger brother had ducked youthfully under his arm and leapt ahead of him. Renewed by the growing shouts and cheers from below, the young lad set his sights on the elder brother. This brother was tougher in stature, but the younger had age on his side. The elder was in the lead by a skidoo's length, and he could not fight the fire in his lungs much longer. As he heaved a burning breath, his younger brother pulled past him, and in a last-ditch attempt to win, in desperation more than hope, the eldest brother reached out and grasped the kilt of the younger as he flew past him. The younger brother, now in the lead, was impeded by this vice-like grip and knew that there was only one way to win the race. In a flash, he reached down and with two feet to go, unfastened the belt around his waist, leaving both his brother and his kilt in the mud. He bounded freely to the top of the hill. With his arms up and cheeks out, he claimed his victory and the crowds below went wild. The whole race took but three minutes, and thus the Highland Games were born. Haven't we all had that experience of thinking we won something just to realise that we've lost our kilt along the way? <laughs> a true winner and a true Scotsman. <laughs> Gorgeous little story, lovely example of how we can connect competitive sporting myths to the Highland Games. But I think this is a great time to think about traditional Highland gatherings and how they contribute to our modern Highland games. But these gatherings that you're speaking of, would they have been between different clans or was it villages coming together? Well, there's a few different kinds of gatherings that we can compare the modern day Highland games to. But first, let's jump aboard the context canoe and paddle downstream to the Middle Ages. Have you got your hypothetical life jacket on? Of course, my hypothetical life jacket is strapped tightly. We're going about 800 years back, just to have a look at where power is falling in Scotland and what this means for communities. From the rocky waters of the north of Scotland, we look out across our paddles and we can see the clan system in the Highlands and Islands is in full flow. The clans over the centuries have created their own power. This is different to the lowlands of Scotland, and while the two cultures develop many similarities, there are some very big differences too. In the Scottish lowlands, I think it's more of a feudal type system, more closely aligned to other European feudal societies. Whereas in the north, we have this clan system, which mixes both kinship and feudalism, to provide people with land, protection and identity. The key difference is the kinship here, because this instills a sense of community within the clans. 
but it also influences the way that they manage their land for the power of the people rather than power over the people. Unfortunately, though, Highland society of this time can often be quite badly misrepresented. It's two sides of the same coin, but it's a coin that completely warps the truth. So if we look at one side of this misrepresentation coin, the Highlands are being portrayed as isolated, backwards, or barbaric. And on the other side of this coin of historic deception, we have heavy romanticization of the Highlands. Imagine kilted clans frozen completely in time, living exceptionally simple lives in beautiful heather-clad mountains and completely ignorant to any technology of the time or any modern developments of the world. And of course, our dear listeners know not to trust either side of this devious coin of lies. And if you ever want a very dreadfully biased perception of the history of any country, then simply look at it through the eyes of the Victorian British elite, who seem to approach writing the history as though their society in that particular point of time was the height of civilization. It's a very dangerous idea. That's why I don't trust legal tender, Annie, and I will only acquire goods by bartering with silver or honesty. Why not gold? I can't afford gold. (laughs) (laughs) It's the funeral games of our finances again, Jenny. But anyway, back to medieval highlands, where we have some thriving clans. These communities are well connected to one another, but also to the rest of the world. And although documentation is quite sparse, these folk were known to come together in large gatherings in which competitive sporting events took place. A really fun example of this is in 1314, when two major events happened, and these tie nicely into the Highland Games. The first was that Robert the Bruce defeated the English king at the Battle of Bannockburn. This is a glorious victory for Robert the Bruce. And as a part of the celebrations, the second major event happened. A Highland Games was thrown in series to celebrate this victory and the men from the area's participation in it. I've seen this quoted a lot, that series was the earliest recorded big games of this type in Scotland and that it was a massive celebration after Bannockburn. It was believed that Ceres had been granted a market or a fair by royal charter from King Robert the Bruce himself, and that this annual gathering had been happening ever since, which would mean that Ceres can claim the title as the oldest continuous Highland Games in the world. Now I was a wee bit sceptical of this at first, but actually I've come to accept that it's quite possible. I'm interested, I'm interested, you you came around, you think it did happen now? We can't find the charter, but this isn't unusual as the majority of King Robert Bruce's charters were lost at sea. Ah, that, see, that is why you don't employ a fellow called David Jones to look after your charters. <laughs> Straight to the locker. <laughs> don't, Jenny, this is the Scottish version of the Library of Alexandria burning down. Essentially, these are all the charters establishing how Scotland should be governed. So think all of the laws and rights of people had been taken by a couple of different powers to England and it was finally agreed that they should be returned to Scotland in the 17th century. But then one of the two ships carrying these charters tragically sunk and took with it a lot of priceless documents about the history of Scotland. This is sad. But what's not sad is the series games, and I am 100% there on board for them being the granddaddy of the Highland Games. I've checked the library and museum catalogues where I could, but if anyone knows where this charter actually is, or if it is a lost charter, let us know right in. Yeah, search your attics. (laughs) Search your ponds. (laughs) (laughs) What won me over was extracts like the one that you're about to read, um, which was just from 90 years ago. 
but it's telling the series Bannockburn story and they just it made me smile and it also made me want to be less skeptical so maybe I'm approaching history with my heart rather than my head there we go (laughs) by unsuspected tactics and great skill in manoeuvring King Robert the Bruce outgeneraled the English and decisively defeated their immense army. The series men returned with long beards and tattered kilts, but in great spirits. There and then they resolved to celebrate the famous victory of Bannockburn and have fulfilled their pledge through their descendants for six centuries without a break. I just love that this is what the games means for them to be connecting with their ancestors over the generations. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. And there's some great descriptions of the original events too. It's said that at the series games in 1332, a heavy rock was fetched from the bed of a mountain stream, I assume for lifting and throwing. And for throwing the hammer, they used a huge club with an iron head. This is a fabulous medieval version of the traditional events we see today in the Highland Games, the shot putt and the hammer throw. We know that in medieval and early modern Scotland, athletic contests were frequent, often organised by the monarchs and the major players in their courts. All right, so if we then head back up north to the Highland clans at this time, It was common for the chiefs to summon all of their clansfolk together for gatherings. The biggest of these gatherings were scheduled around the agricultural calendar. And if we had a time machine, Annie, I would 100% go to the end of the harvest season and not midwinter because this is a time of plenty and a time where there is much to be celebrated. And while these meetings and gatherings allowed clan leaders to conduct clan-wide business, they also allowed the folk gathered to make merriment, socialise and have some fun. And it's not hard to imagine that amongst the banter and bravado for some sporting competition to spring from the jovial crowds naturally. Because nothing says, hey, let's be best friends than having a wee competition to see who can throw 56 pounds of rock over the tallest bar. I mean, you, yeah, that'll do it for a lot of folk, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we met. <laughs> yeah, that, it was a high bar. High bar for friendship. <laughs> These big clan gatherings would be the perfect time for good-hearted sporting contests, but also for other culturally significant activities like piping, dancing, and perhaps some military strategizing. They are large, well-organized social events, and it's the spirit of these gatherings that remain at the core of the modern Highland Games. But while our modern games do draw some likeness from these traditional ones, as you said before, they're often seen as a pale imitation of these gatherings. So where does that break happen? Why is it that what we have now is so different from the traditional clan gatherings of back then? Oh, well, enter our antagonists of this episode. We've mentioned them before, but we have the 18th and 19th centuries to blame. Well, we have them to blame for quite a lot, mainly corsets. As we enter into the 1700s, the clans have already lost a lot of their powers and many of their chiefs are turning their back on their former beliefs and are behaving more like landlords. Add into this mix a little bit of failed rebellion. So in 1745, we're seeing Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobites defeated at Culloden. From this comes large-scale oppression of Highland culture by the British government. People often use Culloden as a landmark for the major decline of the Highland ways of life. However, this is a bit of an oversimplification because the clans no longer held the power that they once had. And so many of the chiefs of the clans had turned their backs on the people to get individual power for themselves. However, I find it very important to still mention Culloden and the oppression that happens after Claudin, because 
this absolutely throbs in the collective imagination as being the tombstone on the old ways of Highland life. Plus, we do see post culloden laws passed that restrict the freedoms of Highland people, especially laws that stop them from expressing their culture. This includes laws against Gaelic language, traditional dress, and big gatherings. Then, coming to the end of the 1700s, we have the Highland Clearances, which are brutal evictions across the Highlands and Islands. Landowners are essentially kicking out families, sometimes whole villages, from their land, often people who have been there for generations and generations and know nowhere and nothing else. Some of these landowners were descended from Highland chiefs who would have been custodians of the land on behalf of their community and some of them would be relatively new, buying it from the chiefs or possibly land that had been confiscated by the government from Jacobite rebels. But by the 1700s, this land is seen as a resource and the landlords want to make a profit on it. And they aren't viewing keeping these ancestral communities on the land as being profitable. This all results in massive economic and cultural repression in the Highlands for regular everyday people. It's pretty rough. But Highland people don't go down without a fight and Highland societies pop up across Scotland and the world in order to preserve Highland customs. They're often led by diaspora communities, either Highlanders who have moved elsewhere in Scotland or across the globe. In Scotland, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and even in England, we see Highland societies popping up as a way to tie a healing bandage over and onto the Highland traditions. But then, by the mid-1800s, Highland games were in full swing once more throughout Scotland. And they were becoming very close to the modern games that we know today. But with so much of the traditional culture wiped out, these games weren't put on by your everyday folk, but rather the aristocracy. Annie, have you heard of the term Balmorality? I Balmorality is a play on Balmoral Castle, which is the residence of the royal family when they visit Scotland, and the word morality. It's talking about the fascination and romanticisation of Highland culture by the British elite during the reign of Queen Victoria. Wow, you really do know about Balmorality. You nailed it. <laughs> Queen Victoria loved her Scottish base in Balmoral, and Balmoral is actually very near to Bray Mar, where Malcolm Canmore had his hill race in the 11th century. And Queen Victoria took a real interest in the Highland Games that were put on here. And her royal enthusiasm sparked a revival of interest in the Games, especially amongst the aristocracy. And whilst in Scotland, her entourage of wealthy and privileged acquaintances engaged with an idealised picture of the Highlands. They were massively enthusiastic about the rural, rugged wildness of the land and were enchanted by the apparently timeless Highland traditions. However, they took these aspects of Highlandness and, with their very upper-class British views, decided on how they should be interpreted and preserved. Perhaps the most fitting example of this comes back to this infamous hill race. Amazingly, the race was still a main event at the Braemar Games in Victorian times. In 1842, it was measured out to be 1,384 yards long and a man named James Cutt ran it in just four minutes. But... Queen Victoria felt that the race was too dangerous and was detrimental to the competitor's health and so she decided to abolish this centuries-old tradition and she banned the race. So we're seeing her sort of pick and choose what parts of Highland tradition she likes and that is what ends up being passed on. They would also dress up in versions of Highland garments that they had adapted to their fashions and tastes but behave like these garments were traditional. 
and what they ended up looking like was not at all representative of Highland life. They repainted themselves into Highland landscapes, using tokens of Highland culture to meet their Victorian ideas of purity through rural, humble work. Though none of them were doing any rural, humble work. And then because these images of wealthy people performing Highlandness are far more distributed than the real image of Highlanders, they end up perpetuating quite a misleading picture of the original culture in modern times. There's quite a dark side to this as well in that there's some writings that talk about Highlanders living in poverty at this time but the Victorian view that that would bring them closer to God, that they had everything they needed, and that the lack of any temptations somehow made them more noble. Our takeaway is that the people who were actively involved in damaging Highland culture, and the people who held all of the power during the clearances, and enacted this violence against the Highlands, then took on the role of preserving Highland culture. But they cherry-picked the aspects, so they only preserved that which met their so-called refined tastes. But they have all the influence, so what ends up happening is that their fake idea of what Highland culture looks like ends up leaking into both how Highlanders see themselves, how other Scots see Highlanders, and how diaspora communities end up engaging with their own Highland heritage. Highlanders end up absorbing the false aspects of their own culture. It's kind of like how you can look at an apple in the mirror, but you can't make an apple pie with the version of the apple that's in the mirror, because only the one in your hand is real. Well, the Highlands are the real apple, and the Victorians are the mirrored apple, but then somehow the mirrored apple becomes the real apple. But it's like you take a real apple and an apple in a mirror, and somehow manage to make a pie out of both of them, even though technically you're only meant to have one apple. <laughs> but you can't eat a mirror pie, that's what I know. Not easily, at least. <laughs> It's Schrodinger's romanticised Highlands. But what ended up developing wasn't a fashion or a fad from the Victorian elite. It ended up being everyday Highlanders, Scots and diaspora communities who were keeping the culture alive. And certainly when you go to Highland games nowadays, these are the key people that you meet. I think there's a fascinating question here about ways that we express our culture and traditions. And how long do you need to perform a culture before it becomes an authentic tradition? Just because the modern Highland Games were shaped in the 1800s by elitists doesn't make them less valid as a massively valuable festival of Highland tradition. I think the modern Highland Games are fantastic, but I do think understanding their complex history can help us explore and celebrate Highland traditions more authentically. And sport has always been a way for communities to assert and define their identities. And the Highland Games that we know today have evolved from a both ancient and complicated past, but they remain a way for people to actively respond to the changing world and to celebrate their current culture and their old heritage. It's great. Today's Highland Games have many events that hark back hundreds of years, and the event most commonly associated with the Highland Games from these times is one which requires strength, balance, coordination, a good strong neck, and accuracy. It is, of course, the caber toss. The word caber derives from the Gaelic word kabar, which means a wooden beam, and that pretty much sums it up. 
cavers are usually made of the nice straight trunks of either Scots pine, larch, or fir trees. The top 10 foot of the trunk is cut off, and then the next 16 to 18 feet is cut for the caver. And then the lower remaining portion of the trunk is discarded. And then all the branches are removed. Ah, uh, yes, yes. That would wreak all sorts of havoc on the aerodynamicity of the throws. <laughs> But the natural taper of the trunk is important, as it means that the wider end is heavier and the narrower end is lighter. The tosser, the person who's throwing the caber, picks it up from the narrow end so that the heavy end is high in the air. This gives the caber a heavier centre of gravity and allows it to turn in the air more easily. Now, they usually weigh between 150 and 175 pounds, so between 6 to 8 and 80 kilograms, which is like in the ballpark of how much I weigh, so it's literally someone picking me up by the ankles and then flipping me onto my head and celebrating my good form. (laughs) The only difference is, Jenny, that you are not 16 to 18 feet tall, so your centre of gravity would be all off for this game. (laughs) This is true, this is true, but practice makes perfect, Annie, so I don't know, I'm not giving up on it yet. (laughs) It can be hard to discern the weight of the caber, and the weight is often exaggerated, so be careful out there, people. If you're being chatted up at a Highland Games, and anyone says that they can toss a caber over £175 easily, I'd be very wary, for you may be getting (laughs) caber-fished. The Scottish version of Tinder. (laughs) The Tinder swindler? You got caber fished? (laughs) (laughs) So for the caber throw, the tosser leans the caber against their shoulder and the side of their neck. They then squat and shimmy their clasped hands down the caber in stages until they have a firm grasp on the base and the weight is balanced above them. Then, with an almighty yet controlled haul, They hoist the caber up off the ground and stand up with it, ensuring all 18 feet above them are steadied. Then they run forward with the caber balanced in their hands and after a few steps stop abruptly. And then using this momentum, they heave the caber into the air. All going well, the caber's high centre of gravity will mean it turns 180 degrees in the air before thumping down on the heavy end. The narrow end, now up in the air, continues with forward momentum and falls with a thud to land far away from the thrower. After the tosser has released the caber, they must stay exactly where they are. Because the caber is not tossed for distance, but rather straightness. The judge will run up behind the tosser and judge how straight they threw the caber from where they released it. It's measured using a clock face method of judging. If the caber has fallen in a directly straight line from the thrower, then this is a perfect throw, and it will be given a result of 12 o'clock. If it deviates a little to the left, it will receive an 11 o'clock result. A little to the right, a 1 o'clock result. So it's as if the caber were a giant hour hand on a watch and the tosser is the central pin from which it moves. Precisely. And in a very close competition, the scores will be read in minutes. So five minutes to 12 or seven minutes past 12, with points being deducted for how far off 12 the caber is. And that's how you toss a caber, in case anyone wanted to know. (laughs) I got really into the caber toss. I was watching loads of videos online. (laughs) I was having a lot of fun with it. I don't know if that's super boring or interesting, but I really enjoyed it. (laughs) I think your mum would be really proud if you took up caber tossing. I would love to. I like, like reading all about these heavy events. I think I was born to be a Highland Games tosser. You'll always be a tosser in my eyes, Jenny. (laughs) And there's all sorts of murky, murky mythology about how the caper toss became a competitive sport. One theory is that ye olde lumberjacks became proficient at tossing cabers so that they could cross the many burns that cut through the forested areas of Scotland with ease. 
although preparing and tossing a cable seems considerably less easy than building a small bridge. I don't know, Annie. Not if you're a pro. Because there's a world record for the most caber tosses in three minutes. And guess how many cabers have been tossed in three minutes by a fellow called Danny Frame from Canada? I don't know, a, a dozen a dozen cabers? 16 cabers have been tossed by this man in three minutes. And I don't know, I feel like he could probably build a bridge across the river nice in no time with those kind of stats. Well, it's a more likely theory than that of soldiers tossing cabers across moats in order to siege castles. I feel like a man tottering along with a giant log is quite an easy target for archers. Yeah, but then if you have a Canadian guy tottering along with 16 logs at once, suddenly becomes harder to hit him, doesn't it? <laughs> but that man didn't do all 16 logs at once. He did them one at a time cabers. in three minutes. <laughs> He is not sieging a castle with that. <laughs> I kind of want to watch this guy siege a castle. <laughs> we also have rich folklore of giants throwing trees, often as spears, which can cover massive distances. Or they'll even use trees to pole vault across the sea, which is great fun. There's a cool Irish legend about a giant Cúhulin, who is trained in the art of war by a Scottish warrior expert named Skahach. She's infamous Scottish warrior woman, so we'll definitely do an episode on her soon. It was unfortunately demanded of poor Cúhallan that he kill his dear foster brother, and he really didn't want to do this. So Cúhallan tries persuading his brother out of the fight he's like now nah, let's just make peace not war everything will be fine but his brother refuses to back down and this causes a massive argument Kuhalin is so engulfed in this dispute and their battle of words that he's not looking where he puts his massive feet and he steps on an exceptionally sharp piece of holly Furious at this holly tree, Kuhalin rips the massive tree out of the ground. It's at least 15 meters high, and he tosses it over his shoulder in caber tossing style, except backwards instead of forwards. Unfortunately, fate has a funny way of dealing with warriors, and the tree hits his foster brother, who he really didn't want to fight and immediately kills him. Oh no, that's intense. What a sad, sad story. Tossing at a spiky caber is a whole different level of commitment to the sport, and I'm, I'm glad that at least that bit hasn't carried over from mythology. It also explains why they're always tossing cabers forwards and not backwards, because you don't want to accidentally kill a beloved family member. That's very true, yeah. I think it's most likely that the caber toss came around as a way to show the sheer power, strength and accuracy of people. And much like why we throw rocks, because they're part of the environment that we use and work with, I think this is also why we're tossing cabers. And if you've never seen a caber toss, I highly recommend going to a local Highland Games if you can. But if you can't, watching them on YouTube because... It is an astounding physical feat to watch, and I, don't, I just got really into caber tossing this week. <laughs> <laughs> the category that the caber toss is in is called the heavy events at the Highland Games, and when we look at some of the other heavy events, it's very easy to see why they are called this. Yes, you've got putting the stone, or as it's more commonly known nowadays, the shot putt. Traditionally, and still at quite a lot of Highland Games, what they'll do is they'll go to the local river and pluck out a suitably weighty stone from the riverbed. Now, it doesn't have to be circular, it's no specific shape or weight, but they just decide that this is the one that we're going to be throwing today. If you've seen Braveheart, where <laughs> Mel Gibson is oil... I, I, in my head, he's covered in oil. He might be clothed. I can't remember. But he... <laughs> But he proves his strength at the beginning of Braveheart by putting a big stone. What better way for Mel Gibson to assert his masculinity? <laughs> well, it's not via height. 
<laughs> or via accent. <laughs> this is true. This is true. And like with Fingal's Cave, there's a lot of Scottish folklore about giants hurling huge stones at each other. It's said that the distinct granite tor of Clachnaben in Aberdeenshire was actually originally a stone thrown at the giant called Jock O'Benachy by his pesky rival, Jock O'North. Now, Jock O'North lived just a boulder's throw away of about 30 miles on Tap O'North Hill Fort, and that's why we've now got this lovely granite tor in Clachnaben. And again, beware, people, if you're being chatted up by someone who says they can put the stone 30 miles and they're not 20 feet tall, then you're getting caber fished again. Sorry. You want to avoid caber fishing. It's a genuine threat to society, a menace. (laughs) Another heavy throwing event you'll see is the hammer throw, where essentially a three foot long sledgehammer is whirled around the thrower's head before being released and sent flying in, hopefully, the right direction. You also have throwing the weight for height, which I gotta say, again, watching videos, one of my favourites. This is where the thrower will hurl a stone of 56 pounds high over their head. During the competition, the bar gets higher and higher and higher. They're really chucking this massive stone just as high as they can and then running away. (laughs) I can't watch that event. It gives me an anxiety to see it in real life and it genuinely... It, they aren't that close that they're going to get the stone fall on their head. But just the optics of it look like the person who has thrown the stone up high is then going to get crushed by the stone. I, I, it just, it turns my tummy. But <laughs> if there's one thing about the Highland Games, there is certainly a lot of throwing. This is true, and that's the heavy events. But you'll also see events like wrestling, long jump, high jump. They even had pole vault at some of them. You'll see hill runs, unless Queen Victoria has anything to say about it. And, of course, you'll get your Highland dancing. I love Highland dancing. I actually did Highland dancing when I was a child. Oh my gosh, can you teach me the basic moves? I used to do it in bars in America to prove I was Scottish, but I was just totally winging it. (laughs) (laughs) My favourite Highland dance has always been the sword dance, known also as the Gilly Callum. This is where the dancer successfully bounces the paddy bar between the crossed blades of two swords, ensuring that no blade is touched whilst keeping good form and staying to the beat of the pipe music. It's an absolute spectacle to see because you've got the swords on the floor, so it feels like a real warrior dance. And there was actually quite some controversy in the 20th century about whether women should be able to do the sword dance because it was seen as a a man's warrior dance. And of course, it's the only Highland dance I would want to do. There's a couple of funny wee legends about the origins of the sword dance. One of them, which is quite unusual but very jolly, relates to the Christian Bible and the story of Noah's Ark. This legend goes that after the great flood, Noah has built an ark and the water eventually subsides and he can leave his ark and go onto the land. When he reaches land, he cultivates a vineyard and there he makes the first wine. Now this is the first time that the Bible mentions alcohol and there's some fabulous medieval illustrations celebrating this moment where from the biblical perspective, they are discovering the wonders of fermentation. And of course, for Highland culture, seeing Noah as a man of great power, he would have to have a witty piper, and this piper was named Gilly Callum. Gilly Callum witnesses Noah drinking this newly discovered wine and subsequently becoming very intoxicated. Noah starts to dance his dance of intoxication and he dances over two crossed vine plants, celebrating the wonders of the grapevine and the wonders of the wine. Gilly Callum is very cheered by this scene and he takes out his bagpipes and he plays a beautiful tune for the new wine and the new dance and the new world after the flood. And this is how the sword dance was born. Now, 
It might shock you, but the Bible doesn't actually mention a bagpiper. Consider me shocked. Or indeed a wine dance. Consider me disappointed. (laughs) But what delights me most is that the Victorian book where we find this folklore also suggests that the reason that we don't dance with grapevines in Scotland is because swords were far more abundant in Scotland than grapes. And so they were considered the ideal substitute for grapevines. I mean, I I can't really imagine making a recipe with something that includes grapes. And I turn to the fruit bowl and lo, there's no grapes left. And so I just pull out my substitute sword. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, imagine if they did that for winemaking, just tried to make wine with swords. There would definitely be sharp undertones and in fact some quite steely overtones to that particular vintage it's a chardonnay <laughs> cabernet sword in yon marl ow you stabbed me <laughs> <laughs> with my pointy noir <laughs> claymore non blanc <laughs> <laughs> you mean stabbing on blanc <laughs> oh man I mean, we're joking with this, but this is actually how they make iron brew. (laughs) (laughs) Now, another myth associated with the sword dance comes back to old Malcolm Canmore once again. It's said that during the Battle of Dunsinan in 1054, where Macbeth, the King of Scotland at the time, and his forces were locked in a brutal fight with Malcolm Canmore and his men. During the battle, Malcolm defeated one of Macbeth's right-hand men, and with this, the battle was won. In celebration, he threw down his bloodied claymore upon his vanquished foe's sword in an X shape, and proceeded to jubilantly dance between the blades, and thus the sword dance was born. But no matter its exact origins, the sword dance is an ancient Scottish war dance, perhaps done before battle to show speed, agility, strength and precision. It's a beautiful thing to see. And it was believed that if the dancer accidentally touched one of the blades whilst dancing, this was a bad omen for the battle to come. But then, on the flip side of the sword, if they were to complete the dance without the blade touching their feet, then the battle was sure to be won. Do you think if we do a successful sword dance before releasing this episode, it'll become a hit? I think the chance that either of us could perform a successful sword dance is so outlandish that we'd end up toeless and showless. Yeah, you're right. I'd probably bet a couple of toes on that. What we've covered in this episode is just a fraction of the fun that can be had at the Highland Games. There are just simply too many events for us to go into in this episode and to be honest we could do a whole episode on each of them because there is just so much so I don't know me and the caver I would happily visit that for 45 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) The Highland Games have indeed been transformed from wherever they began but I hate any insinuation that the Highland Games aren't authentic. There's always someone in a comment section online whining that the meaning of the original Highland Games or Tartans have been too heavily changed by the Victorians and that this makes them less powerful cultural icons. And I could not disagree more with that. The ultimate meaning of Highland Games is to bring people together in celebration of Scottish sport and culture, its unity and its community, and anyone who has been to a Games can feel this. Growing up in the Highlands, the two big events of the summer are the Farmers Show and the Highland Games, and people really looked forward to these. And especially when you're young, it's just such an amazing day. Competitors taking part in the Highland Games are doing an active duty to keep our culture alive. Nowadays, the people who are keeping the Highland Games going are the people who have a true care for authentic Highland culture. By far, the most important thing for me is that we keep 
this unique aspect of Highland culture going, growing and developing with the times. The Highland Games are a global celebration of Scottish culture, both ancient and new. As this culture evolves, the games adapt to reflect this, and that makes me really proud. In Scotland, there are many different Highland Games to go to. Most usually last around a day and draw crowds of a few thousand folk. They're a fantastic day out where you can watch some truly astounding physical feats while also hearing the wonders of the pipes, Highland singing, storytelling, and of course, you can get some haggis. But I do have to say, in America, Highland Games are a whole different caber to toss. <laughs> <laughs> There are truly some huge Highland Game festivals in the US, with tens of thousands of folk visiting over the many days that they're on for. We were chatting to an American earlier this week, and she told us of the Estes Park Highland Games in Colorado, where they not only have an active working trebuchet, they also use this trebuchet to try and hit an inflatable Loch Ness monster that they have out floating in a lake. And I looked it up. I watched it. I watched them hit it. This is, they do this. It's crazy. <laughs> I mean, this is not exactly traditional, but I can't imagine anything more inspired by the Scottish spirit of rebellion. I am a hundred thousand percent here for this. You know, Urquhart Castle on the shores of Loch Ness does have a working trebuchet. And I mean, who needs an inflatable Nessie when there's a real one in there somewhere? You know, we could... Uh, <laughs> Nessie is an endangered species and there's no way that this podcast could ever advocate for trebucheting the real Nessie. <laughs> Who'd have thought this is where the episode would end, huh? <laughs> oh, America. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> A massive thank you to everyone listening, you wonderful, beautiful people. If you'd like to support us as we make this show, you could give us a wee five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcast, as this helps other people to find us. You can also join our Patreon, a place where we release lots of fun extra Scottish content. A gigantic thank you to our Patreon supporters, old and new, who help us bring this show out and... Genuinely, the support of our patrons keeps us going and keeps us trying to make this show better each time. It means so, so much to us. A big Highland hello to our wonderful new supporters who are... Lisa, Gabriella, Rachel, Heather and Kimberly. Thank you all so much for supporting us. I like to think of you all as a collective of Loch Ness monsters or as is the official terminology, the correct collective noun is a mystery of Nessies. Unexpectedly, we are having our own Nessie trebuchet tournament on the banks of Loch Ness because for some unknown reason, we just have a love for medieval warfare devices. However, instead of using cannonballs or volleyballs, we are going to use wild haggis that we catch whenever they come to collect water from Loch Ness for their whiskey making endeavours. Now these plump little haggis make excellent trebuchet ammunition and the little creatures are so resilient that they just bounce when they hit the ground and they scarp away back to their hills undamaged so we don't need to worry about the haggis welfare. It has become a very significant cultural event for our Loch Ness monster community that we now even have Loch Ness Monster cheerleaders for the Haggis Trebuchet Tournament. Give me a H A G I S. What does that spell? A big old mess. Is it the Haggis Trebuchet Tournament that's a mess by Loch Ness, Annie? Or is it, dare I say, your imagination? Both. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just had one too many Loch Island iced teas. Anyway, the Loch Ness Trebuchet is a spectacular display and it always goes down in history. I mean, haggistory, because it's the bards of the haggis community who keep records for our mythological beasts. Until next time, slangeva. Slangeva. Aw, 
I cannot limber, Annie, for I am timber. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing you want is a wiggly caver. <laughs> Noodle tossing. <laughs> That's just your cooking, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> it's just true. I'm trying to get it stick to the wall to make sure it's cooked. 